Hello and thank you for joining this podcast. Today's topic is cell transport, subtitled Moving Materials Across the Cell Membrane. The uh, format for note taking, as I explained in a previous podcast, should be the Cornell note style. You'll see that the lecture title is called Cell Transport. You can put the, the date for today at the, across the top. And again, just make sure that um, when you're done with the podcast at the very end, that's really where you would do your summary. You don't need to do your summary on every single uh, page. Again, the whole point of big ideas or chunking is really to take what you've learned and sort of put it into your own words things that you'll understand using your vocabulary. Um, again, focus on the main ideas. Cells have been likened to a lot of things. Um, one would be factories, uh, one would be um, a house like you see right here. The similarities are um, quite a few. If we look at this picture right here, uh, the blueprint for this house, you'll notice that it has various rooms. Uh, master bedroom, bedroom slash den, bath, kitchen, etc. And those could be likened to the organelles in the cell, so the nucleus and the endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi body, lysosome, etc., etc. And you'll notice that around the border of this house here, it has obviously the walls, but it's not a completely enclosed structure. So if we look at uh, these arrows, the green meaning in and the red meaning out, these are the doorways that allow for people and things and pets and um, whatever to leave and enter the, the structure. And then we also have these windows that allow for light and heat to pass through. So really a house is open to the environment just like the cell, whether it be a plant cell or animal cell, is open to the environment as well. So really today we're talking about how do the cells, windows and doors and openings, how do those work? So what is their structure and what is their function? So the big idea for this uh, lecture or, or podcast is that cells use passive and active transport to move materials through the cell membrane. So the, the big idea is that the cell needs certain nutrients from the outside environment and it uh, generates waste and other things from the inside environment and it has to do some sort of transport style, passive or active transport. Here's some words that will be helpful for you in understanding the, the podcast. Permeable is a word that simply means that all substances can pass through the membrane. Semi-permeable simply means that some but not all things can pass through the membrane. And then non-permeable would be a membrane through which nothing can pass through. And so most of our, our body tissues and the cells that make up those tissues are actually semi-permeable. So they allow some things to pass through and other things to remain sort of on the outside or the inside. And then the last word is concentration gradient. That simply means the difference in the amount of stuff or material in one location compared to another location. And that term will come up a little bit later. So concentration simply just means the amount of stuff present and then the gradient is the difference between point A and point B. Um, you may have seen a, a graphic that looks like this in a previous podcast, and, and I'm showing it to you again just to highlight the different problems that are solved by cell transport. So you can see that the list is um, fairly long. The main thing is uh, getting food. So our cells need um, sugars, they need proteins to do the body's uh, jobs, the functions. Um, you'll see that um, second line there, get rid of waste. It's really important that the cells would get rid of waste. You can imagine that... Um, very, very quickly, if, if you didn't take out the trash in your house, then it would get really nasty and gross and stinky pretty quick. So these are very important problems that cells solve. So materials that are needed by the cell move through the cell membrane. And so this is just a, a graphic that shows the different kinds of molecules that our cells need. Um, most of these we would call biomolecules, so the nucleic acids carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins would be the four major biomolecules. And in addition to those, uh, you'll see that water, carbon dioxide, and oxygen are also needed for uh, healthy functioning. Specifically, those three are involved in cell respiration and photosynthesis. So depending on whether you're talking about a plant cell or an animal cell, those molecules are instrumental for um, converting sunlight into usable energy called sugars, and then taking those sugars and then turning those into a different energy form called ATP. So this is kind of the overall graphic that I want to use as the 
organizer for this podcast. The the big idea is cell transport, and you can see that it's broken down into two kind of subcategories, that being passive on the left and active on the right. And I've had some fun with kind of making this graphic. We have the uh, the strong rivalry between uh, the two major colleges in Washington State, one being Wazoo and one being UW. And even at this school, there's a lot of staff rivalry between uh, people that went to either school. Um, I myself actually went to neither of these schools. I went to Western Washington University in Bellingham. And so um, I'm just kind of using this as a contrast in, in two kinds of things. So on the left, passive transport can be broken down into simple diffusion, as also it can be broken down into facil facilitated diffusion. And then active transport is represented by endocytosis, exocytosis, and pinocytosis. And we'll go into these a little bit more detail, but we're gonna kind of just jump around um, starting with passive transport and then going with active transport. So this is the classic Venn diagram graphic that is used for compare contrast thinking skills. Uh, on the left would be passive transport, again in the cougar, crimson and gray, and then the active transport would be represented by the circle at right in the purple and gold of uh, the University of Washington. At the end of this assignment, the task will be for you to fill in a graphic organizer like this. You can just include this at the end of your notes in your composition book or what other means that uh, your teacher has assigned. And the idea here is that you would in include five things that are different between these. And so those would be written in the areas here to the left in the non-overlapping space and then here on the right. And then you'd have at least three things that are similar that you would write in the overlapping space. So keep in mind what you might want to include in your exit assignment that, um, that you'll be asked to turn in. So basically we have the, the breakdown of the two ways that materials are moved across the cell membrane. So take a moment and pause this podcast and then try to answer these four questions um, on your own and then um, we'll go over these um, in, a, in a future class. So moving on to the, the next topic, which is uh, passive transport. Um, diffusion is the, the main passive transport method and defined um, as we see here on the screen, it's the movement of molecules of any substance so that they spread out evenly into the available space. One classic example of diffusion would be the, the Axe body spray that has become um, such a controversial thing. Uh, some hate it, some love it, um, but when you spray that very, very soon, um, other people in different parts of the room are gonna smell it very, very quickly. So those particles are, are moving from the source to every available square foot, or cubic foot rather, of that room, and so the molecules are diffusing. And so in a membrane situation, molecules moving across the membrane would be a kind of diffusion. So you'll see in this graphic we have oxygen, CO2, and other small electrically neutral molecules moving across that membrane. Uh, so in this case, the lipid bilayer or the membrane would be permeable to these molecules. So diffusion is influenced by two things. One is the concentration gradient. What that means is the difference in the amount of material across that membrane. So if you have 10% of material on one side of the membrane and we have 90% of the material on the other side, they're wanting to move across that membrane so that they equal out at 50-50. So it's really the difference in those two numbers. So it would be 90% minus 10%. The concentration gradient would be 80%. Uh, and that is going to drive the diffusion. Uh, in the universe, generally speaking, things want to be even. And so in this case, the molecules on the 90% side will want to move across the membrane toward the 10% side so that they both equal out in the middle. The other factor that is um, affecting diffusion is the membrane structure. Um, the structure of the membrane has pores or holes or channels or, or ways for molecules to move through the membrane. And if the molecule that's trying to diffuse is bigger than the pores, then diffusion will not happen. The other two issues, being hydrophilic or hydrophobic, chemically speaking, certain molecules are attracted to each other. Uh, and so in this case, hydro means water and philic means uh, loving. So some mo molecules like to be attracted to water and that affects diffusion and others 
don't like to be attracted uh, to water, and so that would be hydrophobic or, or water-fearing. Uh, oil and water don't mix. That's a common phrase that you may have heard, and that's based on this whole hydrophobic, hydrophilic uh, chemical issue. In this case, no diffusion occurs for a number of reasons. So again, take a few moments, take a pit stop, and see if you can identify the answers to these three pit stop questions. Simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is a process whereby particles, typically molecules or ions, move across a concentration gradient from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. Although the movement of the particles appears to be under directional control, it is actually the result of random patterns of movement. Here we have a system with high particle concentration on one side of an impermeable barrier and a low concentration, zero in this case, on the other side of the barrier. If the barrier is removed, there will be a net movement of particles from the high concentration side to the low concentration side of the system. In part, the rate of particle movement is a function of the difference in particle concentration. This difference in concentration is known as a concentration gradient. The greater the difference in concentration, or the higher the concentration gradient, the faster the net movement of particles will be. Although particles are moving in both directions at all times, the net movement will be down the concentration gradient from areas of high concentration to low concentration. As particles continue to move down the concentration gradient, the concentration gradient will become smaller and the rate of net particle movement will slow. At equilibrium, where concentrations are equal, net movement is zero, although particles are in constant motion in all directions. So moving on to simple diffusion, that's the next topic. Simple diffusion basically is the movement of molecules from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. And they follow two rules. First is that they cannot use ATP energy, so it's a free process. It happens 24-7. We, we require no effort. It just it happens uh, by nature. Uh, this graphic right here just shows you what a, a ATP molecule would look like. Uh, this little explosion sign is typically what we use to represent it, but if you wanted to get more detailed, then this is the uh, structural formula for it. So this is the, the adenine or the A, and then it's attached to this sugar called ribose, and it has one, two, three phosphate, so that's triphosphate. So it's adenosine triphosphate. So diffusion happens without the use of energy. So the food that we eat, the sugars that we consume that turn into ATP energy, those are not spent on the process of diffusion. And then the second is that diffusion always moves areas from where there are more of them to areas where there, is, there are fewer of them. And so as I said before, the concentration gradient is always going from high to low so that eventually they will equalize or become 50-50%. Facilitated diffusion is the next topic, which is similar but not identical to simple diffusion. In facilitated diffusion, the molecules are actually helped across the membrane by what are called channel proteins. So these are like tunnels that allow for cars to pass from one point to another point. Uh, for example, there is the tunnel, which is the tunnel between France and England, and they've actually um, dug underneath the English Channel and they've allowed for the transport of uh, trains and also uh, cars over the 20-mile gap between those two countries uh, underneath the, the channel. So channel proteins are just larger passageways for molecules to move across the membrane. But again, they don't use energy and they transport molecules from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. So slightly different, but pretty similar to just simple diffusion. Some proteins in a cell's membrane act as channels for specific ions or molecules. These channel proteins don't use energy at all. They simply allow the materials to naturally diffuse from the side with more solutes to the side with less. Whether the direction is out or in depends on where the concentration is higher for each different solute. 
Now moving on to the other side of the cell transport uh, topic, that is active transport. And there's three forms of active transport, but let's look at uh, what active transport means by itself. So basically, active transport is the movement of materials across the membrane, but they do so a little differently than with simple diffusion. First of all, they must use ATP energy, so it, it costs your cells um, sugar molecules that turn into ATP energy, so it's not a free process. And then the second is that molecules are moved against their concentration gradient. So what does that mean? In this graphic, you'll see that if you were to count up all of the numbers of particles here on the upper side of the picture, there would be more of them than on the lower side. So we would say that the outer or external environment here would have a higher concentration of particles and that the lower or internal environment would have a lower concentration of molecules. And what's happening here is we have a kind of a time series of uh, events happening. So we have the same molecule here as the same molecule here versus here versus here, but it's actually happening in sequence. So this molecule here is actually being loaded into this uh, transport molecule, this, this, this um, ATP uh, transport molecule, and then ATP is used to change the shape of this kind of clamshell structure, and you'll see that in this third frame, the bottom is closed and the top is open, and now that molecule is, is pumped out. So it's sort of using energy to pump molecules from areas of low concentration to areas of high concentration. So it's exactly the opposite of passive transport. In this case, the cell uses transport proteins which need a boost from an energy molecule. This actually changes the shape of the proteins, causing them to pump different molecules and ions across the membrane. Now from the side with fewer solutes to the side with more. So looking at some specialized examples, endocytosis begins the list. So endocytosis is when a cell takes in or imports large particles through the cell membrane and uses ATP and membrane sacs or vesicles. Um, in our immune system, white blood cells are called macrophages and they will attack and swallow bacteria and viruses this way. And this is kind of a fun little video that shows how that happens. So obviously the sounds were superimposed, but you get the idea that you can see that white blood cell moving toward those two circular bacteria and actually sort of swallowing or engulfing them. Uh, and that's basically how we keep our bodies uh, safe from um, attackers from the outside. Exocytosis is the opposite of endocytosis, where it's the release or the export of large particles through the cell membrane and that this requires the use of ATP and membrane sacs. So you can see in this lower picture, we have this vesicle or this sort of fat droplet, if you will, and it has some product in the inside and it will actually move toward the cell membrane and it'll actually fuse and as it does so, these membranes sort of connect and then a hole is produced and then that allows for the uh, red particles to be released to the outside of the cell. Cells also use energy to transfer materials in bulk, but this time by forming membranous sacs that hold their contents under wraps. In a process called endocytosis, part of the surface membrane encloses the material, forming a sac which brings the contents into the cell's interior. In the opposite process, called exocytosis, the sac moves through the cytoplasm to the membrane, fuses with it, then releases the contents. So quick pick stop, so compare contrast endocytosis and exocytosis, and then identify the two rules that active transport always follows. And the last form of active transport is pinocytosis. And pinocytosis is basically endocytosis, but on a smaller scale. So it's the way that the cell takes in very small particles and liquid as it is um, fulfilling its uh, kind of uh, dietary needs 
getting the materials that it needs to be healthy. So final pit stop, compare and contrast pinocytosis with endocytosis. So in um, kind of conclusion here, the exit assignment would be to create a, a Venn diagram at the end of your notes after you do your summary uh, that you include five differences between passive transport and active transport and the uh, three similarities that they share. Thanks, and hopefully this has been helpful for you.